Hey guys, this is Jerry. So many of you have heard of the Kitty Genovese story. It's in the public consciousness. If you take any psychology class, you'll learn about it because it seems to demonstrate what's called the diffusion of responsibility, which means when there are a lot of people, you are less and less likely to do anything as a bystander because you feel like other people will take care of it. So here's the official story we learn, right? And this was based on the New York Times article that was written in 1964 that basically sensationalized this. But here's the official story. Over the span of 30 minutes, one night in March 1964, in Queens, in New York City, Kitty Genovese, this young woman, was walking home late at night and she gets mugged and stabbed and she was attacked not once, not twice, but three times. And something like 38 people apparently saw it and didn't do anything. That's the official story, right? If you read the story, I'll link it. It said one person during the first attack yelled, hey, leave her alone. That's, that's it. Nobody called the police. Nobody went down to help her. People just in this apartment complex in Queens just watched and didn't do anything. And one guy apparently even slammed his door. He's like, oh, I don't want to get involved. Right? I don't want to get involved. That became a very common thing to talk about a uh, bystander effect. So it really changed the public consciousness. It changed the New York Times. But the thing is, many people have done research into the actual murder, including Kitty Genovese's brother. It's a very fascinating story. He went off to Vietnam because he at first believed the official story too. He felt like Americans were assholes. New Yorkers were assholes. Everyone's an asshole. And he wanted to go do something. And you know, he wanted to care. So he wanted to go fight a war and you know, do something for the country. So everyone, including her brother, started investigating this case. And it's not how it's reported. And even if you read the New York Times article, they actually in the bottom have a correction. They're like, by the way, most of these facts are disputed. Um, please read some of these updates. So even they have admitted that the 60s article was complete fucking shit. So here's some of the actual things that have been confirmed, okay? First of all, it wasn't three attacks. And no 38 people didn't watch it the whole time. The number 38 was pulled out of the police's ass. And it was at night. March is still pretty cold in New York City. For those of you who've ever gone to New York City, March is still pretty cold. So people are sleeping. I believe it's 3 a.m. And there were no three attacks. It was two attacks. And the first time she got attacked, yes, someone shouted from the window, hey, leave her alone. And then um, he ran off, the attacker. And then the second time that she got attacked, someone actually ran down. Yes, someone ran down, not even caring who it was. Didn't matter that maybe there was an armed assailant. She ran down to help and she cradled Kitty Genovese in her arm as the police came. And Kitty Genovese actually died in the ambulance. See, that's the actual story. So that was absolutely that's been, that's been confirmed, okay? Now, the no one call the police thing, this is the very interesting part. You see, we take the 911 thing for granted, right? We, we think, yeah, we just call 911 on our phones, it'll get us to the police. But did you know that only started in 1968? 1964, they didn't have 911. Yes, this is something you never learned because psychology is too separated from history. So psychologists don't know their history, right? There's got to be more consolidation in the social sciences. Your psychologist is thinking about this case in the lens of now. The psychology teacher does not realize 1964, you had to look in your yellow pages, find the police sergeant or wh whoever was in charge of your ward, and then call him. And he, who, there was no dispatcher who would log your call. So two people actually said they called, and one person apparently was pretty sassy with the, direct, with the detective investigating the case, because this is New York, right? He's like, yo, if you just actually listened to my call when I said someone's getting attacked, she would have survived. So two people claimed they called, but again, you can't prove it because again, there was no 911 system, there was no logging of calls. But I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt, man. I think two people did call the police and it was just three o'clock in the morning, you know, people thought maybe the, whoever answered the call might have thought, oh, fuck it, man, people, New Yorkers, fuck Queens, they're drunk. And on top of this, let's think about it like this, okay? It's March, 
it's really really early just like past midnight so it's early in the morning most people are asleep with the windows closed i mean do you really think 38 people just like sat there and watched maybe a few people got woken up fell back asleep maybe a few people looked out the window you know maybe they they thought it was it was some lovers quarreling or something and so like just me personally i've slept through everything i got so good for a few months that I could sleep through noise and lights. Like, I, I, I made it so easy for my roommate. They could have music playing in the living room and all the lights were on. I could still fall asleep. I got that good. So people can sleep through a lot and this was cold. You know, people are tucked in. Their windows are closed because they don't, they don't want the cold air in. And yeah, you, every, yeah, sure, everyone in the building heard it. It just, you think about it logically and then you actually look at what witnesses say and look at the stuff the New York Times actually left out, you realize, no, this isn't a case of diffusion or responsibility. It's not like everyone decided not to give a damn and New Yorkers are callous and people in the city, you live with too many people, you hate everyone. No, no, man, it's just, it's a story, it's an unfortunate story of a young woman that got murdered and it was the wrong time of the day, so not many people were awake and then, you know, there's the problem back then, 911 wasn't consolidated, so people who did call the cops weren't able to get a response in time and then, you know, people were asleep, maybe some people were drunk, you know, it just, it was the, it was the wrong place wrong time for the woman and then new york times had to sensationalize it make it all about how humans don't care anymore especially humans in the city and then it gets spread and ballooned it's in our public consciousness we still talk about it all the time and you know tv shows copy the sensational story and all our psychology classes like yeah see this is an example of humans being all bystanders and not intervening and blah 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 you see so I hope you guys enjoyed sort of me exploring the details of this. There's actually a documentary, Kitty Genovese's brother actually made a documentary about this, kind of laying the facts straight because he was tired of people just misquoting and mistelling the story based on the New York Times sensational article. And I highly suggest all of you watch it. But the ultimate moral of this discussion is that media is really powerful you know this story filled with sensationalist lies or okay let's give them the benefit of the doubt this story filled with sensationalist misinformation you know they didn't confirm all the information it ended up changing how we perceive new yorkers how we perceive people in the city how we perceive what the human conditions become right media is powerful this one article just completely changed a lot of the human and cultural consciousness of America. So, if you're a person in the media, just like, think about the consequences of what you do. I get it, media's cutting costs all the time, journalists are not happy, and I used to be a journalist, I worked with all my coworkers who weren't happy, they're all complaining, but remember why you went into it, right? You cared about telling the story, you tell, cared about breaking a story, you cared about the truth, and if that's not what you care about, get the fuck out of journalism because you don't deserve to be miserable and throw these ideas out of the window. And for everyone that watches the news or gets their news, make sure you get it from multiple sources and think critically about it. Remember, the person telling the story has a bias, the person that the story is being reported on has a bias, you yourself has a bias. So try to break through all of the biases, Try to get your information from multiple sources and think and question. I think that was enough. Remember, March of 1964, that Kitty Genovese story is not as simple as you think. And New Yorkers, people in the city, people in general are not as callous and evil as the New York Times article makes it seem like. So there is diffusion of responsibility. Yes, it's, there's no doubt we humans like to shift to responsibility when there's more and more people. I was just doing my thing. Well, you know, he could have, right? But the Kitty Genovese story is not a good example, not a good case of this. And that's what I wanted to say. So thank you guys so much for watching. Leave a comment, leave a like, press the bell button so you know when I upload more. 
And uh, thank you for the viewer that suggested this story. Um, I don't know what you want me to address you as. I'm friends with you on Facebook. You know who you are, but I don't know what your public name is, your sort of pseudonym is, so I'll just thank you. You know who you are. Anyways, thank you guys so much. Feel free to suggest other topics you want me to discuss. Bye-bye and learn psychology, but take it with a grain of salt also because it's a human science. Bye-bye.